Hello, I am Madhu Sareen, a psychoanalyst in private practice in Delhi, India. I was asked to prepare a paper for the fifth annual Freud conference this year and we are now going to uh, video record this paper. The paper is a technical paper on the concept concept of transference, which is a central idea uh, and concept in psychoanalysis. I have tried to uh, put forward these ideas in as colloquial a way as possible so that the lay public can understand it, while trying to do justice to the technical aspects uh, of the subject. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my old teacher, supervisor and colleague at IPTA, Georges Chimek, with whom I discussed many of these ideas. So I would actually like to dedicate this paper to him. He is no longer uh, alive. The name of my paper is Transfer, Transference and Transformation, Negative and Positive Polarities. In the first part, I talk about the concept of transference. Freud was not a doctor or a psychiatrist, but a philosophically minded researcher who was interested in the nature of human consciousness. He worked in the domain of what today we would call neuroscience or neurobiology. As so many others who are interested in philosophy, he had to realign his theoretical interests for pragmatic reasons, to earn a living and support his fast-growing family. In turn, in order to pursue his research, he started working with patients who presented with varying degrees of mental disturbance. Freud noticed that almost without fail, his patients had intense emotional reactions to him, which were not commensurate with the actual setting and were positively discordant with the doctor-patient relationship. This was his starting point for thinking about a concept he called transference. He eventually concluded that patients had expectations of him and anticipated behavior from him in the here and now of the treatment situation, which were wishes, desires, and associated wishful fantasy constellations that were being repeated and transferred from earlier parts of their life. Freud talked of transference as follows, as new additions or facsimiles of the impulses and fantasies which are aroused and made conscious during the progress of the analysis. But they have this peculiarity that they replace some earlier person by the person of the physician in the present. This is from uh, something he wrote in 1905. He also wrote, it is not created by the analytic situation, but reveals itself there just as it does in all other relationships. Transference arises spontaneously in all human relationships, just as it does between the patient and the physician. This is from five lectures on psychoanalysis written in 1905. Much later, in 1925, in his autobiographical study, Freud reiterates that transference is a universal phenomenon of the human mind and in fact dominates the whole of each person's relations to his human environment. In addition to this observation, he also noticed that patients became better when they were able to remember, express and acknowledge disturbing, painful or shameful memories and experiences. However, at the very same time that such material started to surface in the clinical situation, he also discovered a force or tendency which opposes recollection, which tends to maintain repression and which obstructs and opposes the therapist's, therapist's efforts to facilitate the act of recollection. He soon also learned that resistance arose above all from the fact that what should be remembered was painful for the patient, embarrassed her, or was contrary to her moral feelings. This led Freud to conclude eventually that what he called neurosis or pathology arose mainly due to internal conflicts between different parts of the personality, which were experienced as intolerable and irreconcilable. It was the individual's own sexual and aggressive impulses which above all constituted the repressed. 
and their recollection and rendering conscious, which would lead to the cure. In other words, once these were acknowledged, recognized and accepted, they could be better integrated into personality. The growing understanding of the many forms in which the resistance expressed itself was an important factor in the development of analytic technique. Patients who ostensibly came to seek help with their symptoms, instead of freely talking about themselves or their problems, did just the opposite. Instead, they were extremely selective about what they shared with the analyst and tended to steer clear of certain critical subjects or recollections. When questioned about this, they often stated that these lacked importance or sense. Freud understood that the patient's objections were nothing more than a disguise of the resistance, and the occurrences which appeared in such a disguise were precisely the memories sought, or at least showed the way towards them. Earlier, Freud had used the method of authority and insistence by putting pressure on the patient to comply, which was a carryover from his earlier use of hypnosis. He didn't find this particularly helpful. So he replaced this with setting up a rule for the patient, which he found much more effective. This fundamental rule, i.e. the method of free association, became the basis of psychoanalytic treatment. This involved requesting the patient to communicate all her contemporaneous thoughts with her therapist, everything that occurred to her, without omitting anything whatsoever. However painful or apparently senseless, trivial, unimportant or irrelevant. The patient was asked to become aware of and try to overcome any internal objection or any self-criticism which would keep her from communicating each and every thought that occurred. She was to say whatever was on her mind without selection, surrendering fully to free association. The analyst could then use this associative process to see certain link linkages which were not immediately apparent. That is, Freud distinguished between what he called the manifest and latent content of such communication. It also allows the analyst to become aware of what thoughts and feelings the patient tended to skirt over or to avoid. This process also facilitated the self-observing capacity of the patient and allowed her to see how much her inhibition and censorship lay within, rather than being projected outwardly onto the analyst or to other people. In addition, the patient becomes acutely aware of how deeply implicated she is in subverting her own wish to be cured, despite her active and conscious wish to get better. This was Freud's primary motive for putting patients on the couch and for sitting behind the patient, so that the expressions of his face did not give the patient material for interpretations nor influence her communications. It helped to bring into sharp relief that the patient's expectation and perception of the analyst was very largely colored by her own wishes, fears, anxieties, and fantasies. In other words, by the transferences she brought into the treatment. It was to draw attention to what the patient brings to the treatment situation, her own conflicts and fantasies, that in addition, Freud advocated that it was important for the analyst to maintain anonymity, neutrality, and abstinence. Although Freud regarded conflicts over their own deepest sexual and aggressive desires, the basis of most pathology, there were other conflicts which also beset and troubled patients, such as warring identifications with early caretaking figures, incompatible wishes and desires, conflicts and possibly deficits from even earlier parts of life, before language was part of the child's cognitive and expressive repertoire. And although the latter got more traction as psychoanalysis evolved, Freud was always aware that the struggle against one's own instincts is not always the main cause for patient distress, although these definitely interacted, modified, and conditioned the latter. Freud also considered certain passively suffered experiences, both internally and externally caused traumatic experiences,
as decisive factors in the origins of pathology and suffering. When trauma predominates, especially if it occurs early in life, horrendous negative experiences color and shape perception, affect, judgment and personality. Our earliest, most foundational and formative relationships are with our parents. These relationships retain their emotional charge throughout our lives and affect and influence our wishes, hopes, fears, attractions, hostilities, anxieties, sense of self-worth, satisfaction and disappointment in all subsequent relationship. Each individual takes this for granted and as normative for themselves and for their families, thereby rendering such internal attitudes invisible and unconscious. They also affect an individual's orientation towards sexuality, authority, gender, cooperation, competition and so much else. Trauma has a massive impact, impact on different layers of the child's inner capacities. At the same time, clinical research also demonstrates that the capacity to bear and overcome trauma, to be resilient, is directly proportion, uh, proportional to the resilience of caretakers and their capacity to provide support and help to their youngsters withstand the same. External environmental factors or internal constitutional factors or some combination of both can be traumatic. What happens to a child when their family is preoccupied with external or internal forces and distress, such as poverty, war, famine, dealing often with just the daily stresses and life's contingencies, coping with mental and physical illness and all the losses at, at critical points in her maturation, when not enough attention is or can be paid to the child's needs and burgeoning sense of self. In a country like ours, what is it like for a child to be looked down at and treated with contempt, disgust, hatred or disdain, a subhuman actually, if she or he is not of the right color, class, caste, religion, sexual orientation or gender? What does being apprehended as different, as less than and despised do to a child's and then an adult's inner sense of self and personality? It is conditions such as these that are operative when we say that the child has had a disturbed childhood or has suffered trauma or abuse. Without steady and regular parental care, attentiveness, regulation, tenderness, love, encouragement, firm and fair discipline in those very early years of life, a child and subsequently an adult is not likely to either even name know or be able to rely on her own feelings, to be able to experience, absorb, tolerate and modify one's feelings, to experience them as valid, to experiment and use these affects and perceptions as a basis to make judgments or to develop higher level cognitive capacities, what is sometimes referred uh, as mentalization, requires caretakers to help name them mirror them and contain them. To develop a sense of autonomous agency without feeling paralyzed by anxiety or overwhelmed by uncertainty depends upon early play and experimentation with caretakers who allow and encourage such play, are able to tol tolerate differences in their young ones and provide both encouragement and cautious boundary setting. To be able to develop trust and a sense of security be ready for the give and take of commitment, intimacy and relationship. To feel pleasure, warmth, affection, sensuality and mutuality in interpersonal interactions and relationships with others is based on early experiences of the same. If this is missing, then individual personality will be overcome with a deep sense of deprivation, sense of frustration, overwhelming anxiety, rage and despair, sense of deep injustice, often leading to a kind of personality which is controlling, desperately needy, depressed, anxious, constantly testing boundaries to shore up a fragile sense of self or mitigate feelings of acute vulnerability 
shame and inadequacy. If parenting has been good enough, then what manifests is a relatively unconflicted wish for loving connection, in which trust, authority, reassurance, protection and security are more or less in tandem, accompanied by a wish to emulate, be loved and approved of by admired, nurturing caretakers. On the other hand, when trauma affects early caretaking, then relationships with others are beset by feelings of envy, abandonment, disappointment, deprivation, rage, frustration, humiliation and hatred. In such cases, interpersonal relationships are marked by withdrawal, distancing or protective, self-protective, assaultive behaviours and stratagems. All the above will play out in the treatment situation between therapist and patient, just as they play out in the patient's life, often being part of what they bring in as their presenting problem. These early experiences with caregivers act as the template for all that follows, leading the patient to temper and shape expectations about all future relationships with others and her orientation to the world at large. She will anticipate, assume and prepare to defend herself from similar vicissitudes with others later on in her life. These form the bedrock of future transferences which have their basis in the psychic or, or reality of the patient and which become part of the formation of her personality. Okay. So transference is to be understood as a repetition of the past and the present, a displacement and transfer. Since life is variable, sometimes a bed of roses and sometimes monstrous, the way this affects individual psychic structure is equally variable. Transferences too have both a positive and a negative valence, both rooted in early caretaking experiences. Positive transferences have their roots in affectionate feelings for others, often investing them with the authority of the parent and wishing for the love and approval of such a parental figure. And negative transferences have roots in early feelings of misattunement, neglect, lack of mirroring, or other forms of psychic misattunement and deprivation, which leads to interpersonal strategies of defensive hostility and withdrawal in anticipation of rejection, deprivation, and misunderstanding. Now to talk about the negative feelings towards the therapist. Many budding psychoanalytic therapists have a hard time wrapping their heads around the ubiquity and significance of the transference and have a particularly hard time with the negative reaction of their patients towards them. They feel dismayed and hurt when their tender ministrations and care towards their patients are more often than not received with hostility and aggravation. These feelings are natural, but we have to use our countertransference in our work with our patients, not act them out. What leads people to seek help is usually some immediate situation that seems beyond their individual capacity to handle. What new therapists have to keep squarely in mind is that when patients come in for consultation, there is always a backstory. This backstory lies in the patient's history, within the family and beyond that, in the larger social and natural environment. An individual suddenly finds herself confronted as an adult with something that lies beyond her ken. This has roots in less than optimal development, which results from the interaction between nascent potential individual personality and a less than optimal parenting environment. Many patients are bound to bring in feelings of deprivation, frustration, rage, mistrust, suspicion into the treatment situation, all that they feel in their relationship with others. Otherwise, why would they be there in a consulting room in the first place? A patient may have some implicit sense that there is something wrong. If they have greater psychological and emotional capacity, they can sense that the problem lies somewhere inside themselves, even if they are unsure or cannot quite articulate what the problem might be. More often than not, if their defenses are more primitive, then they feel constantly persecuted and oppressed 
by external forces. These paranoid thoughts are more often than not projections of disturbing, painful, mutilated, split off, dissociated, stimulating, rageful, frustrated inner states, externalized and projected outwardly. Either which way, patients feel helpless and come to see a therapist who they hope might help them. Of course, each patient has her own set of fantasies about what she might be seeking or what she needs, and there is constant pressure on the analyst to somehow know what these might be and try and gratify them. Therapists would expect that patients would have what is called a positive transference towards them, see them as interested, empathic, and eager to help the patient. Instead, beginning therapists, who are indeed attentive, engaged, empathic, and care deeply about their patients, are gobsmacked when the patient challenges, mocks, and tries to undermine everything they say or do. Patients usually demand instant understanding and gratification and have a fantasy that the therapist can read their minds without their having to communicate their thoughts. They often experience the therapist as cruel and uncaring, no matter what the therapist says or does. Patients often cancel at the last minute or want sessions at their convenience, leaving the therapist under a constant pressure to submit to whatever their current demands are, thereby conveying the message that if they did not, then they would feel the therapist doesn't empathize or care about them. One patient complains to the therapist, every time you say something to me, I feel as if a sword is going through my solar plexus and you are cutting my insides out. You can imagine how the therapist feels when they are simply being very attentive and caring. Another patient expostulates, I know you hate me and think I'm rotten and no good. Even your doors are so narrow, they are made to keep me out. I'm not welcome here. And again, the therapist is completely puzzled by this because there's nothing in their style or manner that, that, that accounts for this. It has to be something in the patient's expectations and projections. A patient who has been coming for over a year still comes in and stares balefully, reproachfully and expect, expectantly at the therapist, immediately averting her gaze after a few sit seconds while sitting on the edge of the seat as if prepared to leave at any minute. So what do you want me to say? You think I have something to say? I'm blank. I have nothing to say. As if telling the therapist, it's up to you. Even though I'm here, it's my problem. You have to fix things for me and help me to, to articulate whatever's inside of me. Of course, this is already much too well put together for what the patient is experiencing. In trying to make sense of this, it's important to remember that Freud became aware about the significance of the transference from what he observed as the patient's resistance to the treatment, and it remained one of its most dominant characteristics. This included patients' negative reactions to his engaged and caring attentiveness. It was only after he discovered that in this respect, transference was the enemy of the treatment, that he then turned his attention to it as its indispensable ally. Now to get a little technical. I'm going to talk now about the psychoanalytic treatment process. Hopefully the audience now has some preliminary idea of psychoanalysis as a kind of psychotherapy based on verbal communication which seeks to interpret transference and resistance. The patient brings into the treatment predominantly her relations to very early childhood figures which for different reasons have been stunted or not developed optimally. These relationships are manifest in experiences, images and other representations which are technically referred to as internal objects which encapsulate the emotional reaction of the infant, her projections and her internalizations or interjections. Therefore, these primitive internal objects do not necessarily correspond to or much resemble the original external caretakers. For the experience, memory, traces and representations of the internal objects are distorted by wishes, feelings, projection and fantasy.
Fantasy is an organic, intrinsic part of every individual's defensive constellation. Psychoanalysts try to gain an empathic understanding of the unconscious roots of their patients' conflicts, believing that these are anchored in a long uh, forgotten infantile and childhood past, but which remain as components of their character or aspects of present mental functioning. They try to observe and verbally interpret to the patient how the constellation of internalized self-other representations and the fantasies which underlie the latter, which they regard as the motivating aspects of personality, are manifestly expressed in the relationship with the therapist or the practitioner. So the, analy uh, so the analytic dyad carries the emotional charge and is the uh, repository of the psychic history of both participants, analyst as well as patient. Jean Chimek, one of my teachers and supervisors who emigrated to America after fighting fascism and the French resistance, suggests that psychoanalysis can be regarded as a kind of protected playground with the aim of maximizing the expression of the patient's transferences, but also at minimizing the expression of the analyst's counter-transferences. Psychoanalysts listen to their patient's stories as signifiers of multiple meanings, framed by narratives of desire, of attachment, attempts to maintain self-cohesion and self-integrity, whether attained, thwarted, or aspired for. The goal of psychoanalysis is enhanced self-knowledge and insight, so an individual can seek to embrace and integrate all that is disavowed and submerged in the subterranean, dark unconscious underbelly of the psyche. Having done this, instead of being thwarted and subject to compulsions they neither understand or can control, they can lead, hopefully, a more satisfying li life with a greater sense of agency, coherence and contentment. This account of psychoanalysis has undergone modification over the years and reflects the collective experience practitioners who work with severely disturbed patients or more disturbed aspects of individual personality. Instead of relying only on the patient's verbal communication, uh, the analyst also pays heed to their own internal emotional reactions to their patients, that is their own countertransference, as well as other non-symbolic or pre-symbolic interactions between analyst and patient. I now want to make uh, some more important uh, distinctions and so this is what uh, the theme of my next uh, uh, sub-theme is. Transference, external reality, subjective reality and psychic reality. Distinctions and interrelationship. The analyst's definition and handling of transference, her views of the analytic interaction and her role in it are influenced by her assumptions of the core unconscious conflicts or deficits being expressed in the here and now with the patient. Roy Schaefer puts it this way, psychoanalysis involves the construction of a transference just as it involves the construction of a past, the two being more or less explicitly part of the same process. What always informs an analyst's attitude towards her patients in her interpretations or lack of them is some model of the unconscious past which constitutes and structures the patient's current psychic reality. It is important to note that this is not a biographical past, an account of what parents did or did not do, or even of what the infant or child experienced at the time. It is not the analyst's job to be a historian, a detective or a biographer who aims at an accurate reconstruction of the past as it once was. As Shemek so aptly puts it, the analyst's data obtained only from one biased witness is in no way adequate for such a task. In any case, this is not her actual goal. Analysts try to provide their patients with the past required uh, by their understanding of the present, by what Freud called the logic of the neurosis. Uh, 
And this logic is determined by whatever theory informs their work, whether it be the Kleinian primal mother or the Cohusian or Winnicott ideal good enough or mirroring mother anticipating all our needs or the basic scenarios and triangulations of the Oedipal system. For Freud, psychic reality involves a limited set of primary fantasies functioning as a set of categories which organize and give personal meaning to basic aspects of experience. They can be seen and were constructed as such by later analysts as a system of symbolic meanings, a construction of personal reality, which cannot be merely reduced to or accounted for by external constraints or somatic demands. In a broad sense, psychic reality, in all the myriad analytic theories, functions as a limited set of basic scenarios with a specific cast of characters, Oedipal father, pre-Oedipal or Oedipal, good or bad mother, and prototypical sets of actions. The individual keeps trying to enact such scenarios within the contingencies of her present life in multiple unpredictable ways. Psychic reality is not the reality of our conscious subjective experience, of our perceptions and memories, as is often assumed. Freud refers to psychic reality in his most explicit definition as the most fundamental and truest shape of unconscious wishes. This is from the interpretation of dreams. Unconscious wishes are not simply a reflection of contingent external material events or the demands of somatic needs. Freud surmised and demonstrated that they have an autonomous structure, organization and persistence with an inactive potency and causal efficacy of their own. Transference therefore can be regarded as the here and now manifestation of core unconscious psychic reality. In this sense, the concept of transference is not a self-evident, clearly delineated or even direct, directly observable clinical fact. Transference is always a selective construction based on and relative to specific theoretical concepts and a particular patient-analyst interaction. The analyst theoretical model will determine which aspects of the transference are to be interpreted, questioned and put in a broader perspective and which are left unchallenged and implicitly confirmed, if not explicitly encouraged. Such constructions function as an organizing language, a limited set of interpretive categories, providing coherent meaning to what seem otherwise strange, incoherent or random uh, communications. While such categories imply some hierarchical order and have some loose chronology, they refer essentially to a timeless aspect of the present. Psychoanalysis deals with the mythical time of the unconscious and the sameness and variety of its recurrent manifestations in the present. Schaefer, here and now becomes a condensed, coordinated and timeless version of past and present. So when our patients tell us, aren't you bored with what uh, you know, we say to you repetitively and time again, this is what the patient has to live with and has to come to terms with, which is the repetitive reenactment of their own unconscious uh, impulses and, and uh, desires and their the way they are structured in their personality. Um, so now I would like to go on to talk about the identification of the transference in the treatment situation. Freud's clinical definition of the transference depends upon the convergence of multiple criteria which are interrelated and interdependent. Number one, uh, the first is inappropriateness. Inappropriateness is descriptive and is based on the here and now of the analytic situation. This is based on the analyst's view of the reality uh, of the analytic situation, which defines what is appropriate and inappropriate to it. And it was in the context of Freud's awareness of the great gap between his own and his patient's perception of the nature of their personal interactions and the repeated common and ubiquitous reaction to him that allowed him to judge the latter as inappropriate. His early female hysterical patients 
either passionately loved or hated him, frequently fell in love with him, or feared him as a dangerous seducer, and so on. The dramatic and intense re response of such patients was not warranted by his behavior or the analytic situation. Transference is not always so directly, intensely, and dramatically expressed towards the person of the analyst. Freud, in discussing his work with Dora, realized that he had overlooked the transference as it was alluded to only in an indirect fashion by her and had to be constructed from slight clues. More narrowly, the word inappropriate refers to those of the patient's reactions and behaviors which cannot be accounted for by the here and now, by the analyst's input and therefore contribution to the patient's responses. One has to take also into account that the analytic situation itself is a special and exceptional artificially created interpersonal situation, including the patient's physical position and the analyst's relative neutrality and anonymity, which is designed to bring about inappropriate regressive behavior. Since Freud, except for Kleinians, most analysts do not restrict transference to the person or the analyst or the here and now situation of the analysis in an explicit or manifest fashion. To this extent, we can say that transference meaning rests on the inferences and interpretations of the analyst. Although the analytic situation is designed for being succinct and for a relatively small but constant input from the analyst, many theorists have highlighted the fact that from Freud onwards, the analyst's contribution is always a significant factor in the patient's reaction. How much should an analyst interpret it? There are only a few references to the subject in Freud's writing. In the Future Prospects of Psychoanalytic Therapy written in 1910, for instance, he expresses his satisfaction at being able to interpret much more than before thanks to the acquisition of new knowledge and his hope for future progress in the same direction. However, if we look instead at what he says about his actual clinical practice, we find Freud was always open, creative and very active with his patients. He asked questions, illustrated his assertions by quoting Shakespeare, made comparisons and even undertook an experiment with Dora. If these are reliable representations of how he actually worked, then we can see that Freud interprets almost constantly. He makes detailed and sometimes very extensive interpretations, speaking more or less as much as the patient, and the session is a straightforward dialogue. Those who look, link the concept of classical technique with mostly the patient talking and a strong and silent analyst who says very little will have to conclude that in this respect, Freud was not a classical analyst. We can compare this to what used to be called the classical technique in which the analyst is largely silent and intervenes very little as elaborated by Theodore Reich and Ernst Glover, analysts of the 20s. Reich in his paper, The Psychological Meaning of Silence, points out that the most significant consequence of the analyst's silence is that the patient, under the pressure of silence, which is usually experienced as a threat, communicates material almost in the form of a confession which until then had remained concealed. However, in psychoanalysis, what restores health is not confession, but making conscious the unconscious, and for this interpretation is necessary. Racker likens the technique described by Reich in using, as a me uh, using silence as a method to induce confessions from the patient as being coercive and manipulative, something similar to a military siege. Here the analyst is largely identifying the patient with her resistances, which does not correspond with psychological reality, since the patient also wishes to overcome them. It also tends to foster negative transferences, i.e the persecutory or idealized transference following or becoming intensified in place of the positive transference towards the analyst about which more anon. Number two, the second factor is resistance. 
This is based on the analyst view of the goals and process of the treatment, which defines what obstructs and facilitates it. This is a functional concept and refers to the function of the transference in relation to the goals and process of the treatment. Freud's first description of resistance identifies it as when the patient's relation to the physician is disturbed and it is the worst obstacle that we can come across. Resistance to what? Freud simply states that this is whatever interrupts the progress of analytic work. Essentially, resistance is whatever the analyst views as interfering with the goals and process of the treatment as seen by the analyst. Freud originally used his experience with hypnosis and later the pressure technique when the patient resisted the will and demands of the analyst and refused to cooperate. This obstructed regression to an altered primitive state, allowing access to the memories and experience which lie at the root of the present symptoms. Later, Freud discussed resistance as a struggle between patient and analyst, between impulse and intellect, between the analyst atten attempting to compel the patient to remember the past in the realm of psyche rather than repeating it in action. Resistance generally takes two forms. Number one, negative feelings towards the analyst. Number two, strong erotic and or other wishes insofar as they demand direct gratification or trigger strong inhibitions and avoidance of the analytic situation. Insofar as the past is experienced as contem contemporaneous and real in the relation to the analyst, it will increase the patient's resistance to revealing her thoughts and impulses to the very person to whom they are directed. The third important factor is repetition of the past. This too is based on prior assumptions and theoretical models of the typical past conflicts that are likely to be re-experienced by the patient in the here and now, in the playground of the analytic situation. The concept refers to the basic meaning and origin of transference. Freud came to realize that crucial aspects of the early past were unlikely to emerge in memory and had themselves to be inferred and reconstructed primarily from their transference manifestations. Transference is a repetition of the past and the present, a displacement and transfer. For psychoanalysis, the past is only accessible in terms of its repetition in the present, in the here and now, of the dynamics of a particular interpersonal situation. However, it is important to note that the only way this past is accessible is not through some prior knowledge or account of it. It is only the breaking of resistances by means of the facilitating transference, which allows for the possibility of remembering the past, which is the ultimate goal of the analytic process. In actuality, the analyst has to start with a model and a prior expectation of certain general types of past conflict. To remind the audience again, here Freud does not take remembering to mean the patient's production of conscious memories of the crucial events or experiences of early childhood. Early childhood memories are always scarce and incomplete. Freud called them at best screen memories, a manifest content which has to be interpreted and whose latent content has to be uncovered by the interpretive activity of the analyst. Such conscious memories had no privileged position for Freud, but regarded by him as equivalent to the products of free association, such as dreams and fantasies. He used all the above equally as evident manifestations for the confirmation and specification of his reconstru uh, reconstruction of the in quotes past. For the patient, the main difference between memory and transference material depends upon the patient's beliefs about the reality and origins of her mental productions, that is, whether they are experienced as memories, fantasies, or perceptions. For both patient and analyst, 
belief of, beliefs about the past influence experience of the present, differently formulated and understood by both. In turn, the changing aspects and meanings of the present influence and modify the experience of the past. Schaefer puts it this way, Reconstructions of the infantile past and the transferential present are interdependent. And to even further narrow the gap between remembering and transference, analysts consider much of present perception as organized and mediated by the past, that is by prior selective schemata and how much memories of the past are remodeled in terms of the present. The analyst brings to the treatment situation her own model of the relevant past, a set of selective expectations based on her general theoretical orientation as well as the ongoing data of the uh, particular analysis. This model plays a crucial role in determining what amongst the patient's behaviors is transference as the repetition of a particular past. And in turn, the transference behavior will be seen as one of the main sources of evidence for the specific knowledge and confirmation of the past. We also need to take into account the fact that remembering is directly influenced by the present state of the transference. That is, its occurrence as resistance or facilitating transference, but also its content insofar as it is a communication to the analyst in the analytic situation. Now I wish to go on to the next uh, theme, which is interpretation, transference, and clinical process. What moves the treatment process forward are the analyst's interpretations. In a psychoanalytical treatment, the analyst reflects on her emotional response to the patient, tries to understand the effect the patient's behavior has on herself, and understands this as a communication from the patient while keeping in mind as much as possible those responses which are entirely a part of her own personality and not commensurate with the situation. It is this process, comprehended in its totality, that is presented to the patient as an interpretation. This interpretation should be verbalized directly and concisely in terms of the here and now present. We describe to the patient what is going on and we explain why we think it is going on. We allow the relationship to evolve and we try to draw the patient into looking at the relationship. The patient may respond in either of two ways. If the uh, interpretation resonates and makes sense to her, she feels relief, thinks about it, and this opens the way to intensifying and deepening the treatment process. At the same time, the interpretation has the effect of interfering with her usual coping mechanisms. This can either loosen the defenses or bring about additional further defensive behavior. This continuous shift in the interactions between the analyst and patient, brought about and provoked by the analyst's interpretations, reveals in the analysis the patient's defensive structure. Thus, analyst and patient learn together how these defenses were built up and affected her relationship to both internal experiences, images or representations of early caretakers or others in her personal life. The analyst's relationship to her patient is a constant emotional experience in which the analyst's desires, frustration, frustrations and anxieties are real and fluctuates with the movement of the transference. It is crucial for the therapist to try and not be reactive to the patient's provocations, to try not to reality, uh, retaliate, to try not to enter into incessant power struggles, not to gratify the patient's constant and incessant demands. In other words, to try not to submit to the patient's sub symptoms or defenses. The analyst should seek to continue to try and understand what is happening in the here and now of the treatment situation and see its links with the patient's psychic history. The therapeutic outcome depends to a large extent on the analyst's capacity to maintain her positive countertransference, uh, 
over and above her reactive ones, and her continuing and repeated attempts to try and regain attunement, empathy, and understanding of the patient's transferences. There is an inherent paradox in the psychoanalytic relationship. It involves the reworking of infantile childhood scenarios in more adaptive ways. This stresses equality and the patient's autonomy. And yet the treatment process involves the fostering of regression and awareness and awareness of the transference, which evokes the infantile childhood nature of such conflicts and the powerful feelings of helplessness and dependency associated with that time. A major treatment issue is how the analyst handles the authority given by the transference, uses it and or challenges it. According to Schimek, it is precisely the analyst's role and position in an asymmetrical and structured interaction that allows her to contribute a different perspective, possibly more broad, objective and detached than the direct, intense and narrowly centered experience of the patient. The analyst neither sees, in quotes, truth in the patient's utterances or tries to basically challenge or disown the patient's experience as mere surface or manifest content. Rather, the analyst attempts to illuminate connections and patterns which suggest additional and alternate meanings to the patient's experience. The attempt is to expand rather than invalidate, negate or supersede a patient's experience. Freud uses other images and metaphors in talking about psychoanalysis and analytic treatment. He talks about being like a mirror to the patient and sometimes adopt, uh, adopting a surgical attitude towards the patient's treatment process. Freud's proposal that the analyst be a mirror was a precautionary measure to prevent a practice prevalent amongst his contemporaries of relating facts of their own life to patients. It was to avoid the treatment process become a vehicle for the analyst's narcissistic preoccupations that Freud advocated that care should be taken to stay as far as possible with the clinical material provided by the patient, that is to act as a mirror for the patient. However, to maintain abstinence and relative anonymity does not mean that the practitioner has to hide being caring, engaged and attentive towards her patients. Also to remind viewers that when he used the term um, neutrality, Freud was referring to neutrality between the three agencies of the mind, that is between the ego, between the primitive impulses of the id and between the superego, and not to ally with either of these, but to show the patient how these were configured in their own personality. When Freud used the metaphor of a surgeon, he was trying to caution and protect the analytic endeavor in other ways, to prevent both analyst and patient from trying to affect a magically quick cure and an unquestioning blind identification with the analyst. On the other hand, Freud assigned great importance to the active fighting and what Racker calls a warm attitude. In further recommendations on the technique of psychoanalysis, for instance, he advises the analyst to show his serious uh, interest to the patient. And in the new introductory lectures, speaking of the co cases in which analytic therapy does not obtain the desired changes due to one particular dependent relation, one special instinctual component, he emphasizes that the result of the treatment depends on the opposing forces that we are able to mo mobilize. But the most significant, uh, significant expression is found in the lectures uh, in 1916 to 17, in which he uh, indicates that the analyst must call upon all the available mental forces to induce the patient to overcome her resistances. Racker suggests that this refers not only to the patient's forces, but especially to the analyst as well. It should be also remembered how much importance Freud assigned to the positive transference in the process of regaining health. It alone moves the patient to accept interpretations and to forgive, uh, to forsake resistances. In this context, Freud speaks of the boiling heat of the transference.
which brings us back again now to the positive and negative transference. <clears throat> transference, as we, as we have seen, and as Freud has stated, is both simultaneously an indispensable facilitator of the treatment as well as the main obstacle. Number one, when transference works to move the treatment forward, it was what Freud thought of as the unobjectionable positive transference. That is, the sublimated, aim-inhibited, affectionate feelings for the analyst, investing her with the authority of the parent, and wishing for the love and approval of such a parental, parental Oedipal figure. It is important to note that this facilitating transference is just as much a repetition, a reenactment, rather than a memory of the past, as the resistance transference is. It has the same origin in childhood passionate libidinal wishes and conflicts. Number two. Freud further distinguishes and separates out different components of the transference in terms of their resistance or non-resistant functions in order to handle them differently. Schimek suggests that the dis descriptive distinction between positive and negative transference as simply the temporary dominance of overt positive and negative feelings towards the therapist was not very useful, given Freud's recognition of the ambivalent nature of all such feelings. Instead, he demonstrates that the distinction between positive and negative came to refer over time increasingly to the positive or negative effects of the transference in the treatment process, or what Freud called the struggle between the doctor and the patient, between intellectual and instinctual life, between understanding and seeking to act. This is from the Dynamics of the Transference, written in 1912. To understand this better, let us consider the following. Freud divided the positive transference, which reflected the passion, uh, patient's passionate libidinal wishes and feelings into two parts. A, as an ally, in fact the main motive force of the treatment, what is often termed the unobjectionable and facilitating transference. B, or as a resistance, that is when the patient presents with and expresses crude wishes and demands in a persistent, unrealistic and rigidly repetitive fashion. Insofar as such wishes are objectionable and conflicted for the patient, they will lead to increased resistance. And insofar as they express themselves openly, they are bound to be frustrated in the therapeutic situation and render the patient hostile. Here the difference between the two is, the first expresses itself by affectionate, trusting, friendly feelings towards the therapist and is a tamed, aim-inhibited, sublimated version of the intense, crude, undiluted, objectionable erotic transference. It is more flexible and adapted to the realities of the present situation with a capacity for delay of gratification and for accepting symbolic substitute gratifications instead of more concrete, tangible ones. The difference between the two expressions of wishes is that one is dominated by what Freud called the pleasure principle and the primary process and the other by what he dubbed the reality principle and the, second process, uh, the secondary process. Freud first makes this distinction in Dora, both being two types of expression of the erotic transference, although he does not explicitly as yet distinguish between the motivating and the resisting aspects of the transference. We are dealing here not with two different transferences, but with gradients, more or less modified and transformed, manifestations of the same impulses and feelings. The relation to resistance versus motivating force is highly relative. The more intense and unmodulated the positive transference is, the greater is its potential to be both a resistance and a motivating force in the treatment. At the beginning of treatment, it acts as a strong motivating force and subsequently as the treatment progresses and it uh, becomes clear that such wishes are not going to be met, then it becomes a disappointment and resistance. Clinical experience shows us that the tamer transference is less likely to be an impediment uh, 
interfering with the treatment, but also a weaker, if more reliable, motivating force and ally of the analyst. On the other hand, it is also important to keep in mind that the reasonable, more tempered aspects of the transference can easily become a hidden and subtle form of resistance, covering over more primitive and conflicted wishes, and thus contribute significantly to unresolvable transferences and interminable analyses, about which I will say more later. How should the analysts use the authority implicitly, implicit in the positive transference to move the treatment for forward? Freud himself suggests the following. Number one, suggestion is not used for the unreliable goal of symptom removal, but rather to address and remove resistance so as to search for and seek the basic roots of symptoms and thus the possibility for lasting inner change. Two, the power of suggestion as transference is itself subjected to treatment and is dissected in all the shapes in which it appears. At the end of an analytic treatment, the transference must itself be cleared away. Although Freud explicitly states here that every aspect of the transference must be analyzed and dissected, both positive and negative, the dominant trend in contemporary analysis and Freud's own clinical statements is different. Most analysts tend to believe that it is only the resistant part of the transference which is to be interpreted and dissolved so as to make effective use of the positive transference as a motivating force. The positive transference, insofar as it is useful to the treatment, is to be left alone and strengthened. Thus, in Freud's words, the positive transference's suggestibility as affectionist trust and belief in the authority, expertise, competence and hence superiority of the analyst is somehow put off limits for interpretation and tends to become part of the so-called real relationship. The transference neurosis, which is to be dissolved, is segregated from a part of the transference, which is called the therapeutic or working alliance, and contrasted with the so-called mature transference, a basic capacity for positive human connection and relatedness. There are some problems and complications with this, since both within clinical reality and Freud's own conception of the transference, it is hard to so sharply demarcate more primitive, intense expressions of transference from more aim-inhibited ones. Also, to the extent that all aspects of all transferences are not dissected uh, in whatever form or shape in which they occur, then psychoanalysis remains open to the charge of being a particularly well-disguised and effective form of suggestive treatment. There are some problems in not attending to some aspects of the positive transference. I will highlight this now. Freud was aware, and so have subsequent analysts, that the aim-inhibited positive transference as alliance can also act as defense and as a resistance which is particularly hard to pinpoint and interpret. It can be the manifest content, the outward expression of repressed, conflicted wishes, fears and fantasies, both erotic and hostile. It can feed on the small sublimated gratifications provided by the reality of the analytic interaction, while the patient holds on to the hope of the ultimate fulfillment of secret fantasies and magical rewards earned by years of good, dutiful analytic work. Seemingly good analytic work can cover up a reluctance to relinquish the image of the analyst as an idealized, omnipotent and all-knowing person who may provide fantasy gratification and be an object of narcissistic identification, not just for the patient but also for the analyst. Both analyst and patient may collude in resisting awareness of the defensive and unrealistic aspects of the positive transference. For the analyst, a positive facilitating transference makes the work easier and can provide pleasant ego-enhancing gratifications. Such resistances and unresolved aspects of the transference can contribute, however, to, re to repeated and interminable treatments accompanied by no real changes in the patient's outside life.
Freud in his paper on transference love says that it is relatively easy for the analyst not to be seduced by the patient's crudely sensual desires, but rather that it is a woman's subtler and aim-inhibited wishes which bring with them the danger of making a man forget his technique and his medical task for the sake of a fine experience. This fine experience would seem to refer to the danger of the analysis turning into an interminable, mutually gratifying, aim-inhibited love affair. At the same time, it must be acknowledged that however expertly one analyzes the transference, the effect of an, an analysis would still to a great extent, and I wonder whether it isn't to a large extent, be dependent on the gratification of the unanalyzed and persistent transference. It is too much to expect that a patient, this is from, uh, said by Merton Gill, it is too much to expect that a patient's basic wishes fantasies and characterological conflicts as expressed in the transference will simply be dissolved. Hopefully through the analytic treatment process, their expression will be modified precisely in the direction of becoming more in aim, aim inhibited, adaptive and flexible. The capacity for sublimated unobjectionable transferences may be more the outcome of treatment than its prerequisite and main motivation. There are some also benefits of some aspects of the negative transference. Just as the difference between the two aspects of the positive erotic transference has been overplayed, the negative transference is often considered only as being a resistance. However, aggression can be expressed on many levels and it need not always be expressed in a hostile way inimical to the treatment process. Aggression can be crude and direct, but it can also be modulated and aim inhibited, such as in acts of self-assertion. Intense global and repetitive expressions of hostility and mistrust towards the therapist are obviously a major obstacle to the treatment, but more mad modulated aim inhibited reality attuned manifestations can act as positive factors in a treatment. For instance, a challenging critical attitude can, go can bode well for the treatment and not just be viewed as an obstructive force. After all, hopefully therapists do not wish for patients to simply accept their interpretations on faith. We would like our patients to consider these as hypotheses they need to mull over and then reflect on and then possibly amend or modify reject or accept as per whether they conform to their own inner reality. We would wish for patients to transform and remold our interventions and interpretations before they can be effectively assimilated. Such a critical attitude, if flexible and modulated and not systematically dismissed by the analyst, but welcomed and encouraged, may protect and increase the patient's autonomy and self-reliance counteract the regressive pull of suggestion and dependency and even become an important contributor to the resolution of the transference. I would like to now come to the final end of this talk, transference, transformation and reality. The concept of transference in psychoanalysis involves the transfer from somewhere to somewhere, a shift of frame of reference. Transference cannot be defined or interpreted along one perspective and with a focus on only one area. Be it that of the patient's experience of the analytic relationship, her current life or her past life. Transference always involves the use of multiple perspectives, both along the horizontal axis of the patient's experience of her life and the treatment process versus the analyst's point of view and the vertical axis of the present versus the past. Shemex helps us to see that such a multiple perspective is not always easy to attain both in theory and clinical practice. If one places too much emphasis on the reconstruction of the past, it tends to make the analysis a kind of intellectual, biographical or literary exercise. An overemphasis on the here and now leads to the danger that the analysis becomes a self-enclosed, self-contained process with little or no connection to the rest of the patient's life. 
If too much stress is laid on the patient's present life, it may lead to the analyst becoming like a real parent, mentor, life coach or guru who tries to teach or advise the patient to lead her life in an exemplary way. All the above pose a real danger for the treatment process because there is always a push to seek for simple, final and unambiguous answers. This is an ever-present and recurring temptation for both patient and analyst. Of course, if one tends to highlight contingency, relativity, transience and the multiple perspectives of the here and now, this tends to generate anxiety and is frequently, if not mostly, resisted. Yet psychoanalysis is built on the hope that this relativity has a freeing effect and opens the possibility for self-initiated change on the part of the patient. It is only the reference and perspective of real life, in addition to that of the past, which allows for the possibility of maintaining the playground reality, uh, both intense and artificial, of the therapeutic-analytic relationship. This is what will hopefully permit for its lasting and flexible transfer to other life situations. The interaction between the analysis and real life is a necessary ongoing process. This is not limited to what analysts call acting out or a change in symptoms, but includes the tangible consequences of the patient's actions as well as her changed subjective experiences in major life situations. The transition from analysis to real life is always accompanied by complex transitions and transformation. A lot of this happens unconsciously, but patients undertake a great deal of more or less deliberate testing, checking and experimenting to see whether and to what extent they react differently in actual life situations without experiencing the same levels of anxiety, inhibition, self-defeating behavior and such like. Insofar as the transference is based on the patient's char characteristic ways of loving and hating, which forms her individuality and identity, it is unlikely to be dissolved or removed like some kind of malignant growth. Its resolution will involve a re-internalization of what is hopefully a modified version of what the patient has gradually been able to transfer to the analytic situation and to rework in it. The effectiveness of the analytic work depends on many factors. Upon the training experience and clinical sensitivity of the practitioner, the special conditions of the analytic setting, and the attributes, powers, and expectations transferred to her by the patient. The analyst can only become the concrete symbol, not the real substitute for the, a holding environment or a good enough mother. This process, while, facil while facilitated by the analyst's actual behavior, depends essentially on the patient's ability to bring to the situation not only a wish, however faint and conflicted, for such a relationship. It also requires the ability on the patient's part to create and use sublimation or symbolic gratification. Instead of being overwhelmed by the pressure and wish for the direct expression and gratification of their impulses and desires. An essential aspect of lasting structural change is an identification with the analyst, or rather an internalization of the patient's changing experience of the analytic relationship. Such a change gets consolidated through its application and modification in the extra-analytic reality of the patient or their real life. In the best case, the analyst uses her clinical skills not to dissolve the transference, but to facilitate the creation and internalization of a modified, less conflicted and more realistic version of it. I would like to end with a quotation from Freud, something he wrote in the dynamics of transference. From the point of view of recovery, it is a matter of complete indifference whether the patient overcomes this or that anxiety or inhibition. What matters is that she will be free of it in her real life as well. Thank you.